Welcome to Christ Episcopal Church's 2020 Lenten Teaching. My name's Bill Duxbury, and over the next few sessions, we're going to spend some time together learning about one of the great masterpieces of Western music, and that would be Johann Sebastian Bach's St. Matthew Passion. Now, obviously, we'd much rather do this face-to-face -face, together as a group, and for those of you in 2019 that went through this, we had the opportunity to do exactly that. This year, because of the coronavirus, well, we're not able to get together like that. So, we're going to do it through this virtual world of streaming. As an introduction, there are many musical works that have transformed the musical landscape forever. The first might be the opera Daphne in 1600 by Jacopo Peri. Handel's Messiah, first premiered in Berlin, and not Berlin, in Belfast, was one of them. The 1808 performance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony changed the symphonic landscape forever and ever. In 1913, there was a riot in Paris when Stravinsky premiered his The Rite of Spring. Moving into the baby boomer generation, the Who's Tommy rock opera in 1969 changed music. I would say the Allman Brothers 1971 live at the Fillmore East changed music. In 1977, Henrique Gorecki's Third Symphony premiered in France. Unfortunately, it was overshadowed by another 20th century masterpiece, the Bee Gees' Saturday Night Fever. The list could go on and on. However, there are a few musical works that are both transformational and transcendental. In other words, they not only changed the musical landscape, but they also had the ability to transcend the listener to something greater, to something higher, to something bigger. Bach's St. Matthew Passion is certainly on the short list of works that are both transformational and transcendental. Over the next few sessions, we're going to delve into this work. I have two major goals for what we hope to do. The first is, we want to look at Bach's amazing compositional skills how he uses his gift as a composer to draw us into the music, to draw us into the action. And the second is to explore Bach's deep reformational Lutheran faith that influenced all of his composition, from his Brandenburg Concerti to his cantata to his various uh, choruses. All the way through his works, we see that his Lutheran faith is always there. So let's get started with our understanding of St. Matthew Passion by going through a brief history of Passion narratives and Passion music. For anyone who has spent time at Christ Episcopal Church, you know that on Palm Sunday, the Gospel reading is done as a dramatic recitation. The story is always from one of the four Gospels, recounting Jesus' last week, ending with his crucifixion and entombment. Different people from the congregation play different roles. Someone is Peter, someone is Judas, someone the high priest, another is Pontius Pilate, someone else is Jesus. And the entire congregation plays the angry mob as they yell, Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! It's really one of the more moving parts of the Palm Sunday service. What you may not know is that this is a very ancient tradition. The first description of such a dramatic recounting comes from a 4th century Spanish woman, possibly a nun, named Ergrida. While on a pilgrimage in the early 380s AD, she wrote back to her circle of friends in Spain in what was essentially a travel blog. In this, she describes the practice of doing a dramatic reading of the last week of Christ in the churches of Jerusalem on Good Friday. Of note, she was also frustrated that the churches had yet to decide on a definitive date to celebrate the Nativity of Jesus. For those of us who went to the Holy Lands this past January, we saw evidence that this has still not been taken care of, as in Bethlehem, 
The Nativity of Jesus is celebrated all the way from December 24th till the end of January. <clears throat> In the 5th century, Pope Leo the Great started to codify which Gospels should be read on which day of the Holy Week, with the Gospel of John used on Good Friday. By the 9th century, the Passion narrative started to have annotations with specific pitches and rhythms. There was a narrator called the Cronista. The part of Jesus was done with someone with a deep voice. By the 13th century, specific melodic structures had been given to various parts and included such notations as the words of Jesus should be done quietly, while the mob should be loud and coarse. One of the most famous stagings of the Passion narrative happens in the Bavarian village of Oberammergau. In 1633, with the bubonic plague killing hundreds of thousands in Europe, kind of sounds like what maybe we've got this year, the residents of the villagers of the village vowed that if God would spare them, they would produce a play every ten years depicting the life and death of Jesus. They were spared and the play continues to be performed every 10 years, supposedly with one happening this year. Well, we'll see. <clears throat> Under the Reformation, started by Martin Luther, music took on a bigger role in churches. By the late 1600, in Lutheran Germany, these passion narratives were scored as oratorios, using many of the forms from the recently invented genre of opera. By the time of Bach in the first half of the 18th century, these passion oratorios were a regular part of the Good Friday service. Bach most likely composed four or five such passions based on all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sadly, only two, Matthew and John, have survived. The others are no longer with us. The tradition of a Passion Oratorio waned from the mid-18th century till the mid-19th century, but then saw a resurgence, mostly because of the composer Felix Mendelssohn, who rediscovered the St. Matthew Passion. To this day, musical settings continue to be staged. In 1966, the Polish composer Paderecki composed his St. Luke's Passion to commemorate the 1,000-year anniversary of the Christian conversion of the first Polish Duke. Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice composed Jesus Christ Superstar in 1970, moving the narrative into the rock and roll age. The Estonian composer Avro Parte in 1989 composed a passion based on, Johann's, on uh, the Gospel of St. John, breaking very new musical ground. So as you see, these passion narratives, both spoken and musically, have, have a long and rich history. Now that we've talked a little bit about a history of the passion narratives, let me give you a brief history of the St. Matthew Passion. Bach's St. Matthew Passion, and by the way, it's not St. Matthew's Passion, but it's St. Matthew Passion, was originally composed around 1725 and was first performed at the St. Thomas Church in Leipzig, Germany on April 11, 1727, which was Good Friday. Bach later revised the work for, for, for performances on Good Friday in 1729, 1736, and 1742. The version we now call the definitive St. Matthew Passion is the 1736 version. In 1723, Bach had been appointed as the cantor, which is music director, of the Lutheran churches in Leipzig, the largest of which was the St. Thomas Church. Bach was well suited for the position, being a man of deep reformational Lutheran faith, a renowned organist, and was considered at the time a passable composer. Well, we know better now. The St. Thomas Church had a tradition of a passion performance as part of their Good Friday Vesper services, a tradition that continues to this day. Bach had already composed one such passion, the St. John Passion, for 1724. 
We are sure that he composed a St. Mark Passion and most likely a St. Luke Passion, but these have not survived the ravages of time. The St. Matthew Passion is by far the most ambitious work that Bach composed. His only work that comes close is the Mass in B minor. The St. Matthew Passion is massive in scope, diversity of music styles, and depth of Reformation theology. The core of the work comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapters 26 and 27. These chapters recount Jesus' last week, including the first Eucharist, his agony at the Garden of Gethsemane, his betrayal and arrest, Peter's denial, his trial, his crucifixion, his death and entombment on Good Friday. In Bach's time, it was required that the words of the narration come directly from Martin Luther's German translation of the Bible. So as we go through the work, you will be hearing in German the Martin Luther translation of the Bible. To this framework of a narration, Bach and his librettist, Christian Frederick Enrique, writing under the pen name of Picander, added arias and choral works. Bach also inserted into the work chorales, we would call them hymns, from the church hymnal. These arias, choral numbers, and chorales allow for a break in the action to contemplate the meaning and implications of the narrative, much like a Shakespearean soliloquy. The final work was almost three hours in length and required two full orchestras, th two organs, three choruses, plus soloists to perform. Bach was obviously proud of his work. In his final 1736 revision, he carefully wrote the entire score out by hand using rulers, a compass, and special red ink for the gospel text. After Bach's death in 1750, from which we mark the end of the Baroque period, the St. Matthew Passion was performed sporadically in Leipzig, the last recorded time in 1800. By this time, Bach and the Baroque style and passion works of music had fallen out of favor. The Bach Passion <clears throat> was all but lost until 1824, when a 15-year-old Felix Mendelssohn was given a gift from his grandmother. The gift to this musical prodigy was a copy of the score of the St. Matthew Passion. Four years later, Mendelssohn staged a performance in Berlin, the first outside of Leipzig, actually. Mendelssohn's interest in Bach started a resurgence of interest in Bach's music that continues to this day. Had it not been for Mendelssohn's grandmother, Bach might be a footnote in our musical history. Before we delve into some of the details of St. Matthew Passion, let's take a look at the major themes that Bach uses in this work. These major themes that permeate St. Matthew Passion sprang from Bach's deep Reformational Lutheran faith. These themes are, first, that mankind is sinful and is incapable of being good enough. Second, Jesus, as both God and man, was sinless. Third, that Jesus loved us so much that he wanted to die for us. That's how deep his love for us was. Fourth, that it was necessary for the sinless Jesus to shed blood and die in order to redeem mankind. And then fifth, is that we should be thankful to Jesus for this death. Note that there are other Reformation themes that are not brought out in this passion. There's the theme of the resurrection, the theme of eternal life, these are not part of this work. There's the role of the Holy Spirit in the redeemed people of God. This is absent. This is on purpose. The Passion was meant to leave us hanging. It was to be performed on Good Friday as the Church commemorates the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. There is yet to be an Easter. There is yet to be a Pentecost. There'll be time later to address the Easter and Pentecost themes, but for now, Bach wants us to come face to face 
with the ugly truth that it was our sins, our wretchedness, that brought about Jesus' brutal, bloody death. Now that we've talked about the major themes of the St. Matthew Passion, let's talk about how the work is structured. In broad terms, the work is divided into two major parts. The first part, over an hour long, has eight scenes and was performed before the Good Friday Vespers sermon. And remember that back in box days, the sermon would typically last about an hour. Paul Walker, take note, I wouldn't recommend that for the Good Friday sermon. The second part, which was almost two hours in length, was performed after the sermon. For those of you who are math whiz, yes, the Vespers service was likely to last four or five hours. Now Bach didn't keep a definitive library of his compositions, much less a record of subdivisions of his works, but over the years many have found it convenient to do so. One such cataloging of his works came about in the mid-20th century and is known as the BWV system. This stands for, in German, the Bach Works Catalog. This system has become so universal for identifying Bach's works. Hence, the St. Matthew's Passion is BWV 244. Now note, if you want intellectual snob appeal, casually drop the ne at the next social gathering that we're all allowed to be together at. I found myself re-listening to BWV 244 this past weekend and was taken by Bach's use of the turba's dissonant chord in number 54 as a commentary on the state of human condition. You'll win that intellectual battle, but probably won't get invited back. This BWV system has also divided the St. Matthew Passion into 78 numbers. Now there's another system that's called the New Bach Edition system that also catalogs uh, Bach's works. In that one, the St. Matthew Passion is divided into 68 numbers. I've chosen to use the BWV system mostly because it was the first system I learned, and I've grouped these 78 numbers into scenes. Not an original idea. I'm not sure I have yet to have a truly original thought. Each of these scenes typically has a narrative action from the gospel with some, sorm, some form of commentary, either from a solo aria or a choral work or a Lutheran chorale. Now with that in mind, I need to talk about some of the musical elements that permeate the St. Matthew's Passion. <clears throat> Bach drew heavily from the traditions of opera. It's hard to overstate how important opera was during the Baroque period. Maybe one way to understand its impact might be that if Bach's town of Leipzig were to have 20 radio stations in 1727, 15 of them would be playing opera. Bach uses four types of vocal works in this passion. The first is recitative. This is used for narrative. It's often written to reflect the natural way we might speak, faster and higher when agitated, slower and lower when relaxed. The majority of the recitative in this passion is taken word for word from the Martin Luther German translation of the Bible. The second musical element is an aria. These are used to comment on the action or to give a human reaction to the action. Much like a soliloquy in a Shakespearean play, we get insight into the human condition. The music of these is more virtuosic and is performed by soloists or occasionally as a duet. Many times, Bach will score these where the soloist has a dialogue with the chorus. It's important to note that none of the characters, Jesus, the evangelist, who would be in this case St. Matthew, Judas, Peter, Pilate, etc., perform arias. Their words are taken directly from the text of the Bible. This is different than, say, in Shakespeare, where Hamlet is going to tell us what is on his mind. The arias are sung by others who are outside of the action. Bach, often scores these arias with a selected instrument from the orchestra, singing along with the soloist. 
The next type of work is a chorus work, like an aria. These are used to comment or react to the narrative. However, in this case, it is a group reaction. When all of the priests demand that Jesus should be put to death, it is the chorus that acts as the priests. And then lastly, the last major musical element is chorales. Chorales are what we would call hymns. This is the only element that was not part of a Baroque opera. Bach uses these very familiar chorales to draw his listeners into the action. They have the impact of saying, this action didn't just happen some 2,000 years ago, it could be happening right here and right now. So just as we have very familiar chorales, hymns, uh, music from our songbooks, these hymns, these chorales would be very familiar to the listeners of Bach's time. Lastly, before we get started in listening to some music, let me give you the major characters in this passion. The first is the evangelist. The evangelist is scored to a tenor. He serves as the narrative of the story. His words will always be sung in what's called recitative, which I defined earlier, and come directly from the Gospel of St. Matthew. In the performance we will focus on, it will become clear that he serves as a much more critical role. Jesus, who is scored as a bass, Jesus will also only sing in recitative his words as recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew. Peter, who is also a bass, will perform his words in recitative. Pontius Pilate, also a bass, will sing his words from the Gospel of St. Matthew. We then have soloists. We have a soprano soloist. She will often comment on the more uplifting, heavenly focused aspects of the story with themes of forgiveness, love, and redemption. We have an alto soloist. She is often given the role of lament, focusing on the themes of our sorrow for our sinful shortcomings. A tenor soloist, he will often be reacting to the themes of pain and suffering of Jesus. And then lastly, as a bass soloist, he will oftentimes comment on the very foundations of our faith, hence using that bass, that deep voice of the bass as a foundation. And lastly, the chorus. The chorus will fulfill many roles. They will be the people of God. They will be the combined priests and elders. They will be the angry mob. They will, not they will not take long before you will see how much they reflect us as people, capable of great good, mercy, grace, and tenderness, yet also capable of being angry and self-righteous. The transformations will often come within one measure of the music. So let's delve into the work. Bach opens his St. Matthew Passion using everything. He's got both orchestras, all three choruses. The words that are sung are a dynamic encapsulation of the Christian faith as expressed by the Reformation. The innocent, sinless Jesus has taken it upon himself to be the sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. The music has a dirge-like feel that tells us this will be a somber work of contemplation. It's done in the key of E minor. This key in Baroque times was known as the key of crucifixus or the key of the cross. E minor in musical notation is written with one sharp, which we would now call a hashtag, I guess. In German, the word for sharp is kreuz, which is also the word for cross. Bach has infused this passion with this kind of symbolism of using the key of E minor whenever he is dealing with the cross. The time signature is a 12-8, which is kind of an unusual time signature because it gives it both a triple meter feel, in other words, three beats, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and a double meter feel of one, two, one, two, one, two. The 12-8 signature is perfect for that. 
The words are sung by sung by the chorus come from Christian Frederick Enrique, who wrote under the pen name of Picciander. He was Bach's go-to librettist. The music, of course, was scored by Bach. Soaring over the top of the two choruses singing together is a boys' choir singing the Lutheran chorale, O Lamb of God Without Guilt. This would have been a very familiar hymn to the congregants at uh, Leipzig. This chorale was written in 1531 by a monk who worked under Martin Luther. The chorale, as with all chorales in the Passion, would have been in part of the hymn book. And so, like I said, this would have been very familiar to the Leipzig church. This uh, boys' chorale is off, was oftentimes used on Palm Sunday and is a Reformation version of the Catholic Lamb of God, Agnus Dei. The style of the two intertwined works is called what we call a cantus firmus. It was originally used when a new Gregorian chant was composed. An existing well-known chant would be played over top of the new one to encourage the singers to learn the new one. In the first performance of the St. Matthew Passion in 1727, the boys' chorale part was played by an organ. That year, that year appears to have been a brutal year for the flu, so many of the boys might not have been available. 1960s example of a cantus firmus might be Simon and Garfunkel's Scarborough Fair and Canticle. Today we might call it sampling. So now that we've talked about box piece, the structure, the themes, all of those things, let's delve in and start to listen. We're going to start at the very beginning, which is a natural place to do. For those of you who have downloaded the PDF file of the translation from German into English, it also includes notes on there. <laughs> yes, I do have a dog too. Anyways, the notes that we have there will um, and the translation are great to look at. We're going to be starting off with number one.
This is obviously going to be a somber piece. This is not a piece of joyful enthusiasm, but rather deep introspection and reflection. After the three choruses introduce the piece, we move on to our first um, instance of recitative. Now remember, recitative is used for narration. It's a manner of singing that replicates the human style of speech. And throughout uh, the Baroque era, there were two forms of recitative, and we find them in this work. The first one is called recitative secco, which is dry recitative. It's used most of the time by the evangelist. In the Baroque time, he was always a tenor. The evangelist is accompanied by just the continuo. Now, the continuo is what's known um, in the Baroque era as usually a harpsichord, a cello, sometimes uh, one other instrument, but very sparsely orchestrated. Normally, the evangelist is a dispassionate reporter of the events, with some notable exceptions in this work. All of the works in the recitative, as I mentioned, are taken from Martin Luther's German translation of the Bible. The other type of recitative is called recitative accompaniado. It's accompanied by the whole orchestra. Now this is used whenever Jesus speaks. Jesus will have 22 speaking parts in this passion. And notice that whenever Jesus speaks, you'll hear the strings playing a shimmering halo of sound accompanying him, as if anointing him as the Son of God, with one very notable exception, and I'm not going to spoil it for you. We will get to that. So let's listen to this recitative You'll hear first the evangelist speaking, and then you will hear Jesus. Dein Jesus, diese Rede vollendet hatte, sprach er zu seinen Jüngern. Ihr wisset, dass nach zwei Tagen Ostern wird, und des Menschen so wird überantwortet werden. Was ihr gekreuziget werde. Ihr 
In number three, we find a stunned and bewildered chorus, here representing all the faithful, and they're wondering aloud, Was ist dein Schlund? Of what are you guilty? Bach will return to this theme of Jesus' sinlessness multiple times throughout this Passion. The chorale words here are by Johann Hermann. He was 1585 to 1657. His words were based on a section of a meditation of St. Augustine written by an 11th century Benedictine monk, John of Fecamp, who died in 1079. The melody was written by Johann Kruger, 1598 and 1662. This chorale will return two more times in the Passion as number 25 and number 55, each time harmonized slightly differently by Bach. We actually find this in our Episcopal hymnal as hymn number 158. <laughs> In scene three, the action moves to the palace of the high priest, Caiaphas. Here, the evangelist recites in dry recitative from the Gospel of St. Matthew about how they want to conspire to seize Jesus by stealth and to kill him. The chorus then returns, this time with their angry side, here acting as the priests and the elders, all agreeing that Jesus must die, but they want to keep it off the radar, as we might say. Note the style of the orchestral music. It's disjointed and angry in nature, yet the vocals, while just as angry, are sung essentially in unison, as if the high priests and Caiaphas and the scribes and the Pharisees are all of one mind, that this is what must happen. <laughs> Und die Ältesten im Volk in den Palast des Hohen Priesters, der da hieß Kaifas, und hielten Rat, wie sie Jesu mit Listen griffen und töteten. Sie sprachen aber: Ja, nicht auf das Geist, auf das Geist, auf das Geist. Scene four, the action now moves to Bethany and Jesus' anointing by the woman with the precious oil at the house of Simon the leper. The evangelist, continuing in dry recitative, recounts from the Gospel of Matthew this story. Immediately following, the chorus comes in with righteous indignation. Notice that they're aghast at the waste, that, they, that so much money has been spent. Why was this so? It's the same way we are. Why has the church, the city, this business, etc., spent so much money on you fill in the blank when there were so many other needs around? Note that the musical texture is almost identical to the priests and the elders in number five. It's disjointed and agitated, once again tying us as the people of God in the same boat with the scribes and the priests. However, note here that the singing is more fugal in nature, and we'll define fugal here momentarily, as if the disciples were searching out a peer group leader to take a cue from. By the end, however, the disciples are in agreement and join in unison that the money should have been spent, armen geben warden, given to the poor. Here, musically, Bach is painting a picture that all people can be self-righteous and capable of a disjointed and agitated life from the evil people, who we call the priests and the elders, to the good people, the very people closest to Jesus. 
Jesus himself now responds in recitative, and notice again the halo of strings whenever Jesus sings here. Notice that when Jesus sings the phrase, in German it'll be Bergen wird, my burial, how the music is moving downward as if into the earth. This musical word painting will appear again and again throughout the work. Let's listen to this. Zu ihm ein Weib, die hatte ein Glas mit köstlichem Wasser und goss es auf sein Haupt, da er zu Tische saß. Da das seine Jünger sahen, wurden sie unwillig und sprachen: Wozu dienest du We now move to the last two numbers of this session of Bach's St. Matthew's Passion. We're going to end with an aria. This will be the first aria that we've come across in the work. Actually, we're going to listen to two ones. One is called an ariosa, and the other is an aria. The difference between these is a little nuanced, but an ariosa is a solo sung in not quite a virtuosic manner, more like recitative while an aria typically is more melodic, has more virtuosic type singing on it. I want you to note on the ariosa, okay, that the, the flute is playing along with here. And this is a thing that Bach does oftentimes throughout his works, where he will score a singer along with an instrument that plays in roughly the same vocal range. In other words, a soprano might go along with a piccolo, uh, alto might go along with a flute, a uh, tenor might go along with a uh, viola, and a bass might go along with a bass. So this has been scored with a flute along with the alto. Notice that while the alto is singing, the flute is repeatedly doing these descending notes as if it's representing the falling tears of this woman. Here the woman is representing the woman who anointed Jesus. So these are her tears dropping on Jesus' head. As we move into number 10, it's one of the more iconic arias of this work. And remember, an aria was a chance to sort of suspend the action. If all we did was have the narration, Bach's St. Matthew Passion would go on for 15 minutes or so, um, because the action only takes up two chapters. We suspend the action and it gives us, as the listeners, a chance to reflect or respond upon what's gone on in the action so far. 
It's similar, as I mentioned, to say a soliloquy in a Shakespearean play, with the difference being that um, in Shakespeare plays, the main characters oftentimes give us insight into what they're thinking. In a passion, we never really hear from the main characters. We don't hear what Jesus is thinking. We don't hear what Matthew is thinking or Peter or Jesus, I mean Judas. All we hear from is other people who have observed. Um, the only words that the main characters have come directly from the gospel itself. They don't sing the arias. The arias are there to represent the people of God and the multitude of our possible responses. They might be deep faith or remorse or doubt or anger. All of these are possible ways that the arias might be um, responsive. The arias in this for the alto um, almost always take the form of a lament or penitence as if she is someone who is very much aware of their sin, very much aware of how powerless they are to control their sinful nature and very much aware of their need of grace and forgiveness. So as we listen to this, listen for those flute notes, listen for the alto as she sings this part, and reflect upon the words and how, might, how you might have reacted to this situation that she finds herself in.
Well, that wraps up this session, the first session of Bach's St. Matthew Passion. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I hope you've gotten some understanding of the music and where we're going, the different styles of music that Bach uses. In the next session, we're going to go over some terms that I've promised I would get to. We will start talking about various musical genres that Bach uses, such as fugue, such as canon, various things like that. We'll also go over a quick biography of Johann Sebastian Bach. And then we will get through a lot more music. We should be able to get through all the way through the end of part one, which includes Judas and his um, agreement to betray Jesus, the first Eucharist, the prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane, and at the very end, Jesus' total abandonment by his disciples. Oh, and also be prepared for a pop quiz. Don't let that worry you. This is a pass-fail course. All right, we look forward to seeing you next session.